Call the meeting to order. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. First item on the agenda, 1.03, approval or revision of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Thank you, Sherry. Second from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next on the agenda, item 2.01, the external audit report. Uh, Mr. Furlong. Yes, yeah, so this evening we have uh, Chris Alger here from uh, our uh, external auditors, and he will be making his audit report to the board. Chris? Thank you very much, Bill. <clears throat> Thank you. Yep, clicker works. Thank you. This here. Oh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Bill mentioned, I'm Chris Elger, Senior Manager with Grossman St. Amour and the Senior Manager on the Fayetteville Manlius Central School District Audit. Uh, it's about my ninth year on the engagement. Uh, my colleague Mark, the partner on the engagement, should be here any second. He sends his apologies for individual traffic on the way. Um, he probably has about 15 or 16 years overall working with the district. Um, so it's our pleasure to continue that relationship. And what we have here tonight is a presentation, a summary of our audit results for the June 30th, 2021 year end. Oh, I'll just use the keypad. So a brief agenda, what I'll be covering here. Every year we, like, we communicate the required uh, topics of governance, covers all the key aspects of our audit results. We'll then present an overview of the basic financial statements or district-wide statements. Next are reports required by uniform guidance otherwise known as the single audit. And then we'll touch on any verbal recommendations that resulted from our audit procedures. So to kick off our required communication with governance, we did perform our audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. Uh, our responsibility is to express an opinion on your financial statements uh, prepared with management oversight. And we're pleased to report that once again this year, we did issue an unmodified audit opinion, otherwise known as a clean audit opinion. Um, and that's really a testament to Bill and his team, the effort put forth. Um, you'll see that coming up as well in some results um, of our uh, audit adjustment results, as well as any um, lack thereof uh, management recommendations that resulted. Our audit was conducted consistent with our plan communicated to the audit committee back on June 16th, 2021. And we did comply with all ethical requirements regarding independence. The district is fortunate to have the knowledge and expertise in-house um, with Lynn Fry being able to prepare those financial statements. So you're not something that every district can say. Um, and our responsibility there, although we do assist Lynn with the preparation, um, the district and Lynn do take ultimate responsibility for those statements. Moving on with the required communications. Uh, we'll touch on our significant accounting policies and significant accounting estimates. The only significant change to note from the prior year here, as you'll see in our second bullet point, was the implementation of GASB 84. And that was a presentation only change for this year. You'll notice that our 60 plus financial statements have been pared down by a whopping two pages this year. Um, that's because those two fiduciary statements are now combined with our government wide, our governmental fund statements uh, that move some scholarship money and extra classroom activity as well as some general payroll liabilities over to the fund statements now. Um, consistent with last year, we have our significant estimates comprised of the useful life of fixed assets, uh, the other post-employment benefit, otherwise known as GASB 75 liability, and our GASB 68 pension liability for the TRS and ERS balances. And again, we like to note that the financial statement disclosures were neutral, consistent, and clear, and they comply with um, industry standards. Moving on, we're pleased to report there was no difficulties encountered during the audit, no disagreements with management, and again, another testament to the great job that the FM team did this year, no uncorrected adjustments proposed 
or audit adjustments in general during our course of our audit. That's certainly not something that many districts can say either. Um, it's really a testament to the work there, the fact that we had no proposed audit adjustments or corrections during the course of the audit. We'll be obtaining a representation letter from Bill as well as Lynn uh, that was sent over to her this evening, and that's really good. It's going to be dated today's date, which can be your official issuance date, and that's going to speak to the completeness and accuracy of all the information that management provided to us over the course of our audit. No management consult consultation with other accountants that came to our attention during the course of the audit, and once again, management's taking responsibility for any assistance, um, albeit minimal, that we provided um, throughout the course of the financial statement preparation, and they'll also be taking responsibility for the ultimate submission to the federal government for the single audit report. And last but not least, our discussion throughout the course of the engagement is not a condition to our retention going forward. So here at next slide number six, we have a high level overview of our basic financial statements. We did discuss these in length with the audit committee um, several weeks ago, went through some financial analytics as well as our findings that we had. Uh, those financial statements are going to give rise first and foremost of our audit opinion, which again is unmodified. Moving on after the opinion, we've got our MDNA, or Management Discussion and Analysis, pages 4 through 12. And this is really where we like to point the reader's um, attention to during review of those statements. It really allows the management to pare down those 60 plus financial statements, um, tell their own story in terms of how the district um, fared during the course of the year. Uh, so a very important section there. Uh, moving on, we've got our basic financial statements consisting of our fund statements and our district-wide long-term assets and liabilities added back. And then you'll see our 40-plus pages of notes to the financial statements, uh, followed up by our required supplemental schedules. Next, moving on from our district-wide statements to our single audit, or otherwise known as uniform guidance financial statements. Uh, once again, we had a special education cluster, the IDEA 611 and 619 programs were our major programs that were audited. Um, I'm pleased to report there as well that transition from Lisa Deneen to Amy Evans uh, seems to go very well. Lisa was very helpful in, in um, um, helping us through that transition. And as you'll see here, the fact that we had no material weaknesses identified throughout the course of that audit, as well as no other matters that were significant enough to warrant our, our um, communication to you tonight. Um, great results there as well, again, for the 2021 school year. And consistent with the district-wide statements, we did issue an unmodified or clean report on that program for the fiscal year. Before I move into any of the specific results or recommendations, I can pause now for any questions anyone may have on the district-wide or governmental statements. Okay. And again, another testament to the success the district had this year for the 2021 school year. In addition to the unmodified opinion, um, the lack of adjusting entries that were necessary, we also had no management letter comments or internal control recommendations that were deemed significant enough to warrant our communication. Another great sign for the district. Moving on to extra classroom activities, um, consistent with every other district that we audit, um, just given the nature of the cash-based transactions um, that are managed by both students and faculty members. We do have a modified opinion for those statements, so nothing out of the ordinary there. And again, we had one cash receipt. Um, again, it's by far fewer than any of our other districts that we audit. Uh, so great job there, great strides uh, made over the years in terms of that completeness of that documentation over the cash receipts. And we say it lacked adequate supporting documentation. There was the cash transaction there enough to prove that it did take place. We're just talking about that very detailed level, individual by individual reconciliation. Okay, last but not least, I'd just like to update you on some upcoming relevant accounting and auditing updates that may impact the district going forward. And this year, in terms of short term for next school year, we're really talking about just GASB standard 87. Uh, it's a lease standard, it's been in the work for a number of years. And that's just going to require that any operating lease that's typically expensed year over year is now going to have an asset and liability on our fund balance sheets, or district-wide balance sheet, I should say. And in talking to Bill and his team early on, we don't anticipate any significant impact to the district for the standard. There may be a few copier leases, a few minor equipment leases hanging out there. Um, so it's really going to just require just getting those leases down and a few additional calculations. So nothing significant there. That concludes our presentation for our 2021 audit. Happy to take any questions you may have. Great. 
Well, thank you very much again. We appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Chris. And Mark is here too. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, Bill, and to the entire business office team for their excellent work. Next on the agenda, item 2.02, .02, proposed capital project overview. Dr. Tice. Sure. Uh, I was just informed that our architect is five minutes out, so either I can go to my COVID update or you know, I can begin filling in. Why don't we go to your COVID update and give the architect time to get here? Everybody think that's about good? Okay. Thank you. The board had asked for a COVID update, which I have included in your board docs. As the month of September turned to October, to date we've had 35 confirmed cases of COVID in the school district, with 23 at the secondary level, middle and high school, and only 12 at the elementary level. Nevertheless, those 12 cases have resulted in 71 quarantines at the elementary level, which is an average of six across all three buildings per case. Whereas there's been only 23 quarantines at the secondary level, which is averaging one quarantine per case uh, because many of the students have already been vaccinated. In terms of the analysis of the data, as you know, even with some part-time teaching assistant and supervision aid positions remaining unfilled, school officials are looking into trying to maximize the social distancing by using other spaces for lunch at the elementary school level. We've noticed a pattern with lunch and the school bus. So to accomplish this task, uh, we met earlier this morning, in fact, and the district has advertised for substitute teaching assistants and substitute teachers via peach jar in the local community. As many of you know, parents have reached out and said, what can we do to help? And these would be paid positions in order to provide the additional supervision to try to divide the students up from the cafeteria to the classroom where we just do not have the adults uh, right now in terms of uh, We've tried to find and fill the positions, but have been unable to do so. So if this comes to fruition, this will allow the elementary students to be divided up between the cafeteria and classrooms or other spaces in an effort to reduce the number of potential quarantines whenever a positive case is reported. In the next section, uh, Dr. Kilmer, who's here tonight, and I talked uh, with the approach of the winter athletic season and more indoor sports as well as special events such as vocal and instrumental music concerts and theatrical productions. School administrators are meeting in advance to better understand and establish parameters for spectators going forward in order to honor social distancing requirements. In the area of online tutoring, given the recent 71 quarantines at the elementary level, school district officials have recruited teachers and retired teachers to potentially serve as online tutors for the elementary children while they're out on quarantine. The tutoring will be for approximately one half hour a day and will be arranged by the school district uh, reaching out to individual families. Classroom teachers will still be responsible for posting the assignments on Schoology and forwarding the instructional materials to students who may be placed in quarantine. Under New York State Department of Health guidance, as mentioned before, we're working to comply with the County Executive Order 22, which requires that all school staff get vaccinated or submit for weekly testing. 
Uh, this requirement was reinforced with the recent New York State Department of Health guidance that was released on September 1st and mandated the statewide. As of this date, Mr. Gordon informs me that we're down to about 35 employees that are participating in the weekly COVID screening. And last but not least, surveillance testing, as mentioned uh, in earlier superintendent's reports, Onondaga County continues to collaborate with local area school districts to conduct random COVID testing of students and employees on periodic intervals. Over the course of the past two weeks, on Friday, September 24th, and Friday, October 1st, the district has sampled 138 individuals between students and staff, and I'm pleased to report that there have been no reported positive cases using the pooled testing with Quadrant. That ends my report. Well, I'm sure we have some board questions. Um, I had two just from your report, Dr. Tice. So the half hour of tutoring that's going to be provided to elementary students who are in quarantine, how did they arrive at that particular amount of time? Oh. Okay, thank, thank you, you for the much. clarification. Yes, we talked about, and again, with the children, just trying to provide some direction, but the, the teachers still would be responsible for the classroom materials and posting the activities on Schoology. And then, so the parents or the new people that are being recruited to help with the lunchtime supervision, um, are they, are they going to be asked to be vaccinated or are they going to be subject to the same vaccinated or weekly testing? Thank you. Additional questions from the board? Thanks for that update, Dr. Tice. Uh, I was just curious roughly how many positions we would need to fill um, to make those adjustments, or I guess it'll be sliding. We met with the elementary principals today. They submitted a sheet. I know we corrected them on the start date. They're ambitious. We've got to fill the positions, but... Uh, Jeff, thank you for your answers. I'm just concerned that I don't know if people watching will be able to hear you since you're not at the mic. That's so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I'm not asking you to repeat all that, but just if there are any additional questions that you can answer for us, I think it would be better if you came to the mic that way that it, I don't know, make sure it picks up on the live stream. Thank I'll you. Stop <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're in a rare form today, aren't you? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I mean, I will just add that we did hear from, from community members before we reopened that were interested in volunteering their time. So perhaps the, those families will be reached by Peach Jar um, that might be interested in this opportunity. Additional questions from the board? 
So, Craig, I guess two things. Um, one, so just to clarify, um, I, we've got a note on here that says we're looking at what we're going to do for the indoor events. But as of right now, there's no changes to all the other extracurricular activities, and all those activities are still ongoing, correct? In terms of uh, extracurricular activities, uh, right? Yes, so after school activities social, and clubs correct. and things that we have, right? right. So there's and no. And you receive the response to your question about dances, correct? Yep. Okay. Got that. Um, and then I guess along those lines, so it was interesting. I, I hadn't thought about this, but Jeff brought up. So we're testing all the employees, but what about um, any volunteers that come into the building? Are we re requiring them to show proof of vaccine or do any testing? So who is doing the quarantine determinations right now? Is this the county or is this the district as deputized by the county? The district is deputized by the county, but the county confirms. We have to submit to the portal. Okay. So, you know, you, you forwarded that email response from Dr. Gupta, who's telling us that she wrote these guidelines as crystal clear as they could possibly be. And from my read, it continues to be as clear as mud. So I'm just curious to, to know what exactly the district is doing with the quarantines and specifically at lunch time, because the guidance that the county provided that Dr. Gupta says is crystal clear, says greater than or equal to six feet, there's no quarantine. Less than or equal to three feet, it is quarantine. She doesn't address in there anywhere of what the case is between three and six. So what are we doing in this district when it's a four foot or five foot distance? If you wanna, it's less than six feet without masks. So there's, there's two things. I'll follow directions to come to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it's pretty clear. So. If it's three feet or more masked, no quarantine. Okay, that's that's universal. So three feet, and that's that's K-12. CDC came out with that, saying that three to six feet in a K-12 setting is exempt. Because their, their focus was oftentimes six and less. So in a K-12 setting, classroom, classroom setting, three to six feet. Don't have to worry about it. The moment you remove the mask, that's when the three to six foot rule begins to apply. So if you're six feet, less than six feet, mask off, vaccinated, you do not have to quarantine. However, we need to notify you and you need to, or the recommendation is, is that you should test three to five days after last exposure. The recommendation is that you wear a mask indoors at all times for 14 days. If you're unvaccinated, mask off, less than six feet, you are quarantined. Okay, so that's, that's what the district is following. My, my, and the reason I ask is that the county guidance that we were given doesn't say less than six feet unmasked, partially vaccinated quarantine. It says less than three feet, 
partially unvaccinated quarantine. So there's two st different sections there. I'm not looking at it with you right now, but from my recollection, the way all of us as the administrators are looking at it is, if it's in a classroom setting, the expectation is everyone is masked, right? So we know we're all universally in this district over three feet, we're three feet and over. So if masks are on, we don't have a single situation where you're gonna have a student that needs the quarantine under those guidelines. The question is, is when masks are off, and so that's really the only time that we are looking at uh, quarantine guidance. And the only time students have masks off are lunch times, wellness break at the high school, or snack breaks at the elementary schools, right? And so that's when we begin to look at. So mask off, it's also 15 cumulative minutes over 24 hours of close contact. And again, close contact is less than six feet with mask off. And so that's why we're looking at anything less than six feet, mask off, is quarantine. And that's how I read the guidance um, based on that document that you're looking at. Hi, I, I, I appreciate it. I just, like I said, I just wanted to know how we're interpreting it internally. So, okay. And, and then, Dr. Tice, my other question is, is back to where we were before school opened. And, and this question of what's the threshold of how many students need to be out of a single class before something more is offered to those students, particularly K-6 where there's a much higher rate of quarantine. So has there been any further talk about what to do when we're putting kids out for 10 days of school potentially multiple times, um, other than potentially a half hour of tutoring once a week. Is there any talk about anything other than that at any threshold percentage of a class that's out? At this time, no. The intent is to try to keep the children in school as much as possible. I'm a little slow on the uptake, but I get it eventually. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the conversation we had this morning, and it gets to your question in a different way. Our goal right now is to reduce the amount of quarantines that are occurring, especially at the elementary level. The two places where they're occurring, well, let's talk about the one place it's not occurring, as Dr. Kilmer said. It's not occurring in the classroom. It's occurring in the lunchroom, and it's occurring on the buses the two areas. So we had discussions really about both today with the elementary principals. So our goal right now is not to accept the number of quarantines we're having at the elementary level, but to figure out how to mitigate those circumstances that are causing the quarantines to occur in the first place. Because ultimately that should be all of our goal, right? To get our kids in school. So going fully remote isn't the answer. I think, you know, some school districts have done that for different reasons. It's not received well and it shouldn't be received well. So our goal right now is to mitigate the number of quarantines, and that's what we're looking at doing first and foremost. The tutoring is a separate piece. It's not an answer to anything, but it does give the parents just another option in order to, for those that do get quarantined. But the goal of this endeavor that we're on right now is to reduce, greatly reduce, the number of quarantines that are first happening from the lunch rooms until such time that those kids can get vaccinated. That's why you're seeing so few at the high school compared to the elementary schools. Elementary students don't have the choice of getting vaccinated. At the high school, they do. So when a student is vaccinated and in the cafeteria at the high school, there's a different set of rules for them than unvaccinated students. In a couple of months, that may change. So this may be a short-term issue. We're certainly hopeful that it is a short-term issue, that it's up until the point when students in our elementary schools can have the option of getting vaccinated and we hope that many of them choose to do that or parents f choose for them and if we can do that we will reduce that and we may not have to stay in this new model that we're looking at for more than a few months maybe we will but right now the goal is to spread the students out we can't get that six feet of distance currently with the way we're doing it and so we're looking at ways at a time when you know that staffing is very difficult everywhere but we're working very hard to try and 
change that model so that we can get six feet of distance between the children wherever they're eating. And if we can do that, instead of seeing nine students go out related to an incident in the cafeteria, you may see zero. And that would be the goal. And suddenly that would change the whole dynamic of even the conversation that you brought up. We would have kids in school, which would be, um, which is what we all are striving for. Thank you, that's helpful. So just my last point on this is, if we're looking to find and hire more people, mm -hmm. and if the effort to this point is sending it out by peach jar, I, I will relay as anecdotally as a parent that I stopped opening peach jars quite a long time ago because they came and they came with lots in it. So can we do that by additional means? The district's yes. social media, the district's yes, web everything. page, everywhere. Can peach jar is one piece. I, <laughs> Dr. Tice heard me speaking to my staff this morning before we went in our meeting and I'm not a very forceful person, but I wanted us all to get on the mission. Uh, that's not related directly to this f food, sir, to the cafeteria issue. Really what we need is, that's a, almost a, an additional or a separate issue. We have a short, short, sub shortage. So other places are experiencing bus driver shortages. We're very fortunate, I'm gonna knock on wood that at this time that's not our major issue. Our major issue is that we have a sub shortage. So in years past, just to give you an example, when the teacher and teaching assistant absent T rate or numbers went up to in the 90s on occasion, and that's rare, but when it happened, that's when my office would get nervous. We knew we had a threshold in the 80s, so we'd have a threshold. This past Friday, we had 57 out, and we had four positions that we couldn't fill. So drastically different. That's Partly because of the pandemic, certainly, people choosing not to come in, not to work. It's also because there's lots of choices out there to work at right now if you want to work. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for that. But yes, Peach Jar was only one piece of the puzzle. We want to have it on every one of the building websites. We want to have it through the Facebook site, everywhere. The reason why we're focusing on our community is because really it's the community that's going to solve this problem for us. It's parents who are out there and they're sending their children to school and saying, hey, you know what, I could come in and I could help out and maybe I can make a few dollars at the same time, but mainly I can help my school system stay open. So that's why we're focusing on our community rather than trying to pull people from North Syracuse or, or other places. Now having said that, I, before I came here, I was in my office and I did get three responses right away from people who are ready to, to jump on board. So I'm hoping that trend continues and we're able to increase that number. My goal is that at the next board meeting, you'll see a, a fairly substantial list of subs be, to be approved. That's, that's my hope. And hopefully we won't have to put it on the billboard like you suggested. <laughs> <laughs> I did offer to put it on a 690 if I had to, yes. That was a little drama, but <laughs> thanks. Additional questions from the board? I just want to say thank you to the administration for, for moving swiftly on this and nimbly and creatively. I know that it, it has been an issue for certain classrooms and uh, especially our youngest learners. And I think just the more we can um, quickly find some solutions, it'll be better for everyone to keep these kiddos in school. And I agree. A lot of credit goes to the district office administrators and the building principals. I mean, we had a month worth of data now. I mean, patterns are developing where I think it would have been a little short-sighted early on, but it's clear in terms of what's happening now. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna go back to the capital project overview. Dr. Tice. Certainly, it's up to the board's pleasure here on how you would like it. Our team did a wonderful presentation at Parent Council on Friday. They're prepared to re do a reprisal of that for the board. You've heard similar presentations before, so I do not want to waste any of your time, but they're here to provide what they did to Parent Council. Daryl, I know, was uh, participating in Parent Council. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, we can run through a quick presentation if you need to dust off the numbers. It's entirely up to you. I, I, I just personally, I think that it would be beneficial at each meeting that we have if we have the materials to go through it. So for anybody watching or watching the video afterwards that we have that opportunity to reach them with the information. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I'd love to hear them again. Right, why don't we have the presentation? All right, Erica. Hey, Erica, how you doing? Good to see you. Good, thank you for adjusting the schedule. The uh, entire duet is out of power and it really messed me up getting here, so my apologies for that delay. Um, so we prepared this presentation for the parent council meeting on Friday. Um, it's really a lot of the same information that you guys have seen before. Kind of just a little bit of facelift. Our goal was to um, graphically be similar to the boards that we prepared um, and the information that's being put out by the um, com communication staff at FM. So, I think, which way am I pointing? I can do it manually. That's totally okay. fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so, as you guys know, we've been working on this project for well over a year now in developing um, the scope. We started with a long, long laundry list of information and went through uh, several, several meetings of prioritization to kind of get it down to the nuts and bolts of this project. And um, really the main goals when we started preparing this scope was to influence and update um, our educational program, social environment, um, infrastructure of course, because that was the skeleton of this project, as well as improvements to energy efficiency and site improvements. So that's, you know, those are the main goals of the project on, um, and how we have established this scope. So you can see here, this is very similar graphic from um, what you have seen before, but this is actually the hard copy boards that were prepared um, that were planned to be placed in the lobbies. I know that a lot of parents now aren't going through the lobbies, so we've put that information into this presentation. Um, you can see there are several categories. It's a little hard to read up there, but the dark green at the top of the legend says building additions. Oh, it does work. So this here says building additions. That is indicating the two main areas, which is the cafeteria expansion and the technology addition that you can see here and here. The lighter green indicates areas of heavy renovation. Those are the main office consolidation, photography lab, auxiliary gym, and learning support center, as well as program spaces in here. You can see in the brownish color, we're looking at finish upgrades. That's mainly the, um, the counseling suite. When we say finish upgrades, we separated that out a little bit differently than some of the other work because there isn't any significant HVAC work occurring in the counseling center. So the next color down is finish and HVAC upgrades. You can see this is mainly addressing all of house two. Um, where there is extensive HVAC upgrades and associated casework and ceiling work and select flooring work going on. So also now included in this graphic is the HVAC. You can see everything here colored in light gray are the remaining areas of the building that are receiving um, various HVAC upgrades. So just to run through the list, we're looking at the cafeteria expansion and addition which is really meant to be the new hub or collaborative center of the school to connect house one and house two. We're looking at a new elevator centrally located near the main entrance, a new grand staircase, um, the technology addition, learning support center connected to the, audit or the um, cafeteria, auxiliary gymnasium renovations, photography lab, student services, classroom finish upgrades, counseling upgrades, auditorium acoustic upgrades, and the HVAC. So going upstairs, you can see in the dark green, again, is that ad addition stretching over part of the central part of the school in house one. And you can see this is really the second story of the technology addition because we're looking at it being a story and a half right now and something that will continue to fine tune as the process goes on. So the second floor 
Again, the cafeteria expansion, is, which is the collaborative learning and student commons, the connection between house one and house two, which is that cafeteria and collaborative space. New program spaces, because we have consolidated, or we're looking at consolidating the main offices, um, there is an opportunity in house two for new classroom space. This floor also has the broadcast, new broadcast journalism space. Again, classroom finish upgrades, mainly in house two and HVAC upgrades. So just to kind of zoom in to the central area of the school, you can hopefully see it a little bit better. This arrow here indicates the front entrance where you enter the building. You can see when you're entering now, you'll be able to visually see where to go to the main office. So that's one of the main security and safety up, you know, upgrades in here, as well as establishing a connection between house one and house two, because currently students have to actually go outside to go back inside to get on the other, to get from house one to house two. So this is the learning support center, which is connected to the lower level cafeteria or um, a learning space and um, that way students can kind of be in there eating and also use this as a multi-purpose function on that main level. The main office also includes the nurses suite right here and the idea is all of these spaces are more attached so people can kind of you can use the same staff you can easily communicate between the nurse and the different parts of the main office without go without going into the main corridors. And you can also see updates to a new photography art classroom and the auxiliary gym. So going upstairs, this is your existing cafeteria right here. This is the existing kitchen. Um, the wall currently ends here and there's the learning support center is in this space. So what we're looking at doing is expanding into the learning support center and continuing the expansion to connect over to house one. And the idea is really to have this space here be a two-story space so that you can have a visual connection between house one and house two. So you're no longer walking in and navigating corridors to traverse across the school. You can visually see where you need to go and, um, and uh, navigate that way. And you can see this X indicates the new elevator connecting from the first floor and these series of lines indicates the grand kind of large staircase that will connect those two areas. So just to kind of zoom in over in the technology area, you can see this is the main corridor um, with where the science classrooms are. We're looking at creating two new technology spaces right at the end of that corridor. The idea was that we kind of mirror the existing LGI and create um, an aesthetic that is very similar to what the building currently has. Um, as I had mentioned briefly, we're looking at those spaces being about a story and a half. Um, that really allows some opportunity for some future programs such as drone or automotive lifts, things that you really need more height. And um, this also has a new classroom in here as well as a technology um, support classroom in there. So you can see everything in yellow is um, to be upgraded with finishes and new HVAC. The areas in green are the, the locations right now that we have identified to get new casework. And this is something, if budget allows, we're going to see how much further we can get more casework throughout the building. I mentioned all that. So this is the second floor. Same, same scope in the classrooms. This is really overlooking the roof of the technology classrooms. And because the main office has been consolidated and centrally located in this plan, you can see there are three new classroom program spaces on the second floor. The just we're keeping this slide in here because I just don't want to lose sight of how much HVAC and infrastructure work is in this project. So everything in gray is being updated to some point or to some level um, in, the, in the entire building. So you can really see, we, we have addressed this area in a previous project as part of the media center work. 
So you can see most of this, most of the building is receiving some level of HVAC upgrades. And these include house two HVAC replacement, complete replacement, house two air conditioning, house one air handling unit replacement, electrical panel replacement throughout, house two boilers, lighting replacement with LED. Now we did have um, an EPC project here, so the LED work is mainly in areas that were not previously addressed and especially in the addition and renovation areas. Um, ventilation system upgrades throughout and aging rooftop unit replacement. So I'm gonna have Patrick talk through some of this. This is some information um, that we didn't have previously that we would like to go through with you guys. Hi, I, I got one, thanks. Patrick Costello, I'm actually an alum from class of 2000. Um, I haven't met many of you guys since I was up here before the Wellwood project. Um, but just to orient you guys, we've kind of flipped the site plan from what Erica was showing architecturally. So the cafeteria addition is right here in the middle at the top of the building, and the technology addition is here. So a lot of the site work that we're doing is kind of reactive for, to what they're doing building-wise. Um, at the technology addition, we'll be doing new curbs and sidewalks, essentially removing, I don't know, the 12-car parking that is in that area currently while providing the vehicular access to that space. Um, the cafeteria addition, we will be providing that secure connection between both buildings, both houses. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to create kind of an outdoor classroom space in that courtyard area that's now being closed off by this addition. Um, so that is kind of a huge opportunity that kids could potentially use for, you know, outdoor lunch and that kind of thing. Um, the entrance plaza upgrades is the area right in gray, uh, right at the main entrance. So it's essentially replacing the concrete and, and trying to spruce that up a little bit. Um, and I know there's some accessibility concerns to the auditorium access space there too for plays and whatnot. Um, fire lane. So fire lane is kind of a huge one. So we're planning in this project for a fire lane that'll be around the back of the building. And this comes about because of the addition. So SED in the last couple of years has been requiring us to add a fire lane 20 feet wide around a building when we have touched it with an addition. And a lot of times that came up as a surprise that they made us do that, but we planned for it here. So that'll actually help Russ also with his access around the site. So I think he's pretty pleased about that one. Um, and right off the fire lane behind house one right here um, is the temporary location for the modular classrooms. So essentially we'll be doing a similar thing that we have done at Wellwood. Um, we're going to place them on the basketball courts there uh, for the duration of the project. Then they will be taken off site. And these are actually the same modular classrooms that are in use right now at Wellwood. So once we're done there, they're going to wrap them up, bring it over here to store it until we're ready for this project. Um, the next piece is really um, replacing the carpet on the turf field because um, that is around 10, 11 years now and by the time this project is up, it, it will be ready for replacement. So we've planned to, you know, put that into place now. The last item on the list is select asphalt replacements. And this is really campus-wide. We really want to touch as much as we can do. You guys have probably already seen what we've done already at the bottom of Pride Lane, and that'll be you know, finishing up here um, next June. So really the plan is to take that from the student parking lot all the way out to the front of the building at 173. So it's pretty uh, important stuff with the life of the, the pavements out there. I know we've been looking at that for a few years now, really when we did the asphalt master plan a few years ago. But really that's the nuts and bolts of the site work. So that is most of the scope for the project. Um, I just wanted to kind of add that that's everything that we plan for right now. And Bob might get into a little bit. There's a lot of unknowns right now with how much things um, will cost when this project goes out. So it is likely and we will have alternates built in the project. So this is kind of the master list. So things um, we will work with the district to when we start to 
design these more closely, you know, we will have to kind of create alternates and things may or may not get into the, the actual project, just depending on the um, bidding climate, okay? And this is Bob. Hello, I'm uh, Robert Marquetta with LaChase. Um, on the project bust, uh, budget estimate here, um, based upon uh, the plans and everything that, uh, that Erica showed you, uh, we worked with our estimating department and the, uh, and the design team, kind of understanding, and, and as well as the district, with understanding the phasing and really the, the, uh, the way forward of getting the project done. Because a lot of it has to do with the phasing is the fact that you know, we're going to be having a, uh, a functioning building. And there's a, there's a lot of work here. Um, so through that process, uh, we came to a determination that uh, the construction duration is going to be about 44 months. Um, and the reason for that length is, again, an occupied building. We have to methodically take parts and pieces um, offline to do work. Uh, part of the um, displacement of the kids will be into the, um, those eight temporary classrooms. Uh, we also looked at kind of front-loading some of the work in some of the areas to create even additional space, additional swing space, so that um, it will allow us to take over more areas as we go. Um, the signature portions, though, of that work, like the main office consolidation, the uh, technology addition, cafeteria expansion, really the, the, the big ticket items will be done uh, within that first 30 months. And the extension of that, that additional 14 months is really that massive amount of HVAC. I mean, that's, that's actually gonna start occurring day one and we'll really carry through for that 44 months. So we'll be, we'll be doing that behind the scenes, um, but what the students and staff are gonna really enjoy will get done in that first 30 months. The, um, the budget was based upon, we, we recently did it with our estimating department, it was based upon current pricing. So um, it was based upon current <laughs> inflated pricing. Uh, but we've also included uh, an escalation of 4.25% over the next two years in anticipation of, of even further increases. And like Erica said, you know, when, when we get to that point, we'll have our bidding strategy. I think things are starting to calm down a little bit, um, uh, but you know, we'll have to wait and see, but we feel confident with, with the number uh, that we've projected here for the 52 million for the uh, entirety of the project. That's not just construction, that's overall uh, construction and incidental costs uh, for the project. I'll let Bill take over for the last bullet. And thank you very much. Good evening again. Uh, one important uh, thing to note, and I think we've discussed this before, is that we do have some significant debt falling off uh, that will be retired in the 23, 24, and 24, 25 fiscal years. Uh, that uh, will give us the uh, capacity to take on the new debt and uh, really minimize, uh, help to minimize the impact to taxpayers. So if we look at the, um, <laughs> says, yeah. uh, there we go. If we look at the uh, overall financial impact, uh, with the estimated cost of $52 million, it's important to note that New York State will be paying uh, over 80% in building aid. Um, it's nice to see that this is one of those projects where we can uh, you know, have the state money uh, come into our district uh, outside of the normal operating aid that they uh, <clears throat> excuse me, pay us. So, you know, once again, for every dollar we spend on this project, and when we borrow money, we, we will have principal and interest payments. They will be aiding the 80% for both those payments, both principal and interest. Uh, they also assume that we're gonna be borrowing the money, that we're gonna be borrowing the whole 52 million. So what's a nice little uh, part of this is that we're gonna be using $7.2 million in cap reserve. Uh, this reserve was established back in 2015 by voters of the district, and uh, the $7.2 million will mean that we'll have initial cash flow to start the work, and it means that we won't need to borrow the full $52 million. 
So based on that, uh, we uh, conservatively estimate that the tax rate increase will be 1.89%. Uh, typically, we like to show what that impact is on $100,000 of taxable value. Uh, for this project, once again, these are conservative numbers. We see a, an increase of $47.80. It's also important to note that this tax impact will be phased in over the length of the project. And since it's a 44-month project, almost four years, we're going to see that average um, about $11.95 per year on $100,000. It's also important to note that that impact will not occur until the 24-25 school year. So it's still a ways away in terms of when the financial impact will be uh, occurring. Any questions about the financial side of this project? That's the close of our presentation. Um, we do, we are planning on a community forum on November 30th. And also there's another parent council meeting on, I think it's December 1st, December 1st. So um, we had our first one on Friday. I think it went really well to kind of start engaging um, parents more closely. And we, we received some good feedback and I think some good ideas too that we can kind of further develop as this project, if assuming the project goes forward. So um, I know you guys have the seeker and the resolution today. Do you guys have any questions on any of that? No? No, we appreciate everything that you've offered and it's a delight to have you back. I mean, reprising your roles from Friday. Dr. Kilmer, anything you'd like to and I know you did color commentary on Friday as well. <laughs> and our communications department, as the board knows, is working on videos to kind of provide a retrospective at the October meeting coming up on uh, the Wellwood High School and Enders Road portion of the project and then at the November board meeting kind of showing an overview of what we've talked about here tonight. That will be in addition to a district newsletter for the vote and I know our district clerk has been preparing for the potential vote on December 7th with your approval this evening. So the community forum on the 30th, where's that going to be? High school cafeteria? Any other questions from the board? Marissa, could I just make a quick comment? Please. I, I just, as a former student at Fayetteville Manlius, I think you might be interested to know that Patrick's dad was on our school board <laughs> in the building of our, of our high school, our current high school. So how wonderful, your grandpa, how wonderful that you're now working on our second iteration of our new high school. New high school, I still call it the new high school. It's great. That's great, and I, I think it's very important um, that we do have these forums and that the board um, express its um, support for this project. And so I'm glad we'll be t talking about this at every meeting. Um, as Dan said, this is the one project that's going to impact all of our students, no matter whether they come through Fayetteville or Manlius. So I think it's important that we make sure that the community knows that we as a board are very much behind this project. And this is, as Erica pointed out at Parent Council, this is conceptual design. Yes. So there is a lot of work to get to schematic design and design development, and that will include meetings with high school staff members, the administration, uh, coaches for the other spaces. I just think we will involve, there will be a lot of discourse as the details are flushed out. Yes. This is really putting the puzzle pieces together to find a concept that would work to so, you know, solve some of these problems you guys are struggling with. And um, when the project goes forward after December 7th, with, that's really when the, the real work starts and um, we will start meeting with anybody using the spaces, spending a lot of time with Mr. Kilmer and um, the administration and the facilities group to kind of further develop these and program the areas. So that's next steps. 
Additional thoughts or questions from the board? Yeah, I mean, I just want to throw my support around this project. Um, I attended the school in the 90s, and it just seems like it's going to be a, a tremendous upgrade in so many ways. And as Dr. Kilmer said at the last board meeting, it really touches all students and all subject areas um, and all um, activities, daily activities at the high school. So I'm really excited about it, and I fully support everything you're doing. So thank you for your hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming this evening. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Item 3.01. Is there a motion for the Board of Education to accept the 2020-21 external audit report as completed by Grossman Santa Moore and the corresponding corrective action plan as presented at the October 4th, 2021 special board meeting? Thank you, Kelly, and a second from Jason. Any discussion? If all those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.02, personnel actions. Is there a motion that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Mainland Central School District approve the personal actions as recommended by the Superintendent Darrell and a second from Sherry? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? <clears throat> Item 3.03. .03. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manley Central School District finds and concludes as follows, that the proposed action is an unlisted action within the meaning of 6 NYCRR 617, that the Board has declared itself lead agency with respect to the environmental review of the proposed project, that upon consideration of the foregoing, the board finds and concludes that the proposed action will not result in any significant adverse impact to the environment, that the board hereby issues a negative declaration with respect to the proposed action, and that this resolution shall take effect immediately. Is there a motion? Uh, Rebecca and Sherry, discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.04, Capital Reserve Fund. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manley Central School District hereby authorizes the transfer of $101,651 from the Special Revenue Fund to the Capital Reserve Fund? And be it further resolved that the Board of Education hereby authorizes a transfer of $98,349 from the unexpended and unencumbered fund balance of September 30th, 2021 to the Capital Reserve Fund. Is there a motion? Dan, second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.05, legal notice. <laughs> I was trying to avoid that. I think I just have to do the whereas. Right, okay. Um, whereas the district is a local agency pursuant to the New York State Environmental Quality Act and implementing regula regulations 6 NYCRR Part 617 and whereas the district is considering undertaking a project consisting of reconstruction, renovation, and improvement of and the construction of technology and cafeteria additions to the high school and the replacement of the synthetic turf carpet at the high school stadium field, including site improvements, interior, exterior, and infrastructure upgrades, acquisition, and the installation of original furnishings, fixture and equipment, temporary modular classrooms during construction, architectural fees, and all necessary costs incidental to such work. And whereas the district's board of education received and carefully considered an environmental assessment form as submitted by its architects, King and King Architects, and is it Appel? Is it right? Appel Osborne Landscape Architecture to assess the environmental impact of the project as required by the regulations, concluded that the project is an unlisted action as defined in CEQA and therefore determined by resolution dated October 4th, 2021, that the project will result in no significant adverse impacts on the impacts on the environment and issued a negative declaration for the purpose of secret. Um, Sarah, do I have to read all the rest of this? 
just make a motion that we <laughs> approve the approve the resolution at, in legal notice as presented. You know, why didn't you do that like five minutes ago? Because you, you, very, started, very helpful. you started right into it. Very, so. very helpful. So, um, thank you. Is there a second to that motion? Thank you, Sherry. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, perfect. Next, we are on oops, adjournment, my favorite one. Is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Dan. And a second from Jason. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, indicate aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? We are now adjourned. Have a great evening. <laughs>